until INEC accepts their mistakes where they don't make, not even only the last year election, previous election where they don't conduct, people go still they expose them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're watching the video from and the time you're going to see this video. I remember my humble self, the Ike. If you are coming across my videos for the first time, I would like you to share my videos. Like, comment, and follow my page if you are not following me. INEC was accept say, did they not do things right in the last election and previous election? INEC is supposed to be independent according to what the constitution said. But are they really independent is the political parties is the political juggernaut what we have for nigeria you know the control i neck it's obvious that these people are being controlled by political juggernauts but this is not what is supposed to be and this is what the obedient p2b want to change in nigeria some narrative we wait on the go in nigeria underground even Openly, now waiting P to be come to call change in Nigeria, and we must allow him to change it. So, so many people, why don't they ask P to be to withdraw, withdraw, withdraw his case, withdraw his case based on what ground? That is my question. I would like you to watch how this man as well expose the the irregularities that happened in the last election, which INEC deliberately did on their own. Nobody say na by mistake as i'm watching this video i would like you to share it like it comment so that facebook and youtube will recommend this video to others to watch i remember my humble self the Ike man we must get a new nigeria that we are looking for we move fact finding a law application procedure plus our first responsibility is to truth and to history so this is a documentation to help us understand where we got it wrong. Now, there are three issues that we laid out here. One is we want to call preparing, first is the, in the shadow of the 2029 election. Let's not forget that all the great work done by civil society and INEC itself and politicians to give us a 2023 electoral act, 2022 electoral act, was to escape the crisis and failure of 2019. Three things came out in that crisis. Number one, was party primaries were not democratic. So the new act created a process for democratic primaries. Two, the notorious case of no server. PDP, till today, believed that they won the 2019 election. And they said, if you check server, you will see our result. INET said no server. And the solution was to have the electronic transmission to solve it real time. Politicians try to frustrate it. And that's why today this publication is the honor of Ario, who worked extremely hard with other civil society people to get that done. So we, this is a series in the honor of Ario Atoye that is memory. So we're looking at how is democracy, how is that vision that Ario and others, the G, all the civil society people, carried on, as some of us even in this room, how is that vision materializing? And so this, this course series that the Abuja School and CBPR are doing is to both memorize Ario's mem to honor Ario's memory and as well to create a learning opportunity for every one of us. So we got the, trans the electronic transmission. They didn't want to sign it, but they signed it. After it has been signed, on record, the national chairman and the national national uh, uh, NSO, uh, S, uh, national organizing secretary of APC said it may not work. In Chatham House, the candidate of the, of the APC says we have no confidence in it. The INEC had to come and say that they would deliver it real time. It didn't happen. Today, we have a situation where in the tribunal we have 18,000 resource sheets blank. How will you prove election without electoral results? So this report, we looked at why did technology fail? And it goes back to the question of unfinished business of always report. How do we create an INEC, electoral managers, who can credibly use technology? Technology is, a great, is great. 
but technology will rely on human beings. During the transactions, we had the Amazon Web Service says the technology did not fail, no hitch. Globally, every hitch, if my computer, I have an iPhone, if an iPhone crash, or something happens to it, they can trace it, they said no. So what happened, human beings? So this is some of the issues we raised. We also raised issue around why the courts are getting more involved in election, judicialization of election. What are the administrative law failures that trigger all this? For example, the Electoral Act says, when you are collecting results, you still have a time to go back and review them, if there are allegations, through administrative adjudication before you declare them. Why didn't the INEC, in many states, constitute that review process that the law allows them? Who should have freed the judiciary from getting involved in messy sciences and arithmetic? So, the report explores all this and shows no debate around facts. Facts admitted by all the reporters. But what we do as scholars is to interrogate what does this mean? What does it tell us about our electoral process? What does it tell us about democracy? Is it enough to have elections? We look around, and this is important because Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, and I think Sierra Leone almost fell into it a few days ago. Guinea had it. We're having a new virus of military rule. Anyhow you caught it, it's a vote of no confidence on democracy. Because democracy has not delivered credible elections and have not delivered development. And so Abuja School is raising the size and warning that let's get back and retrieve what happened in our election. Why did we fail? Why did this election get this way? And what can be done? Again, we talk about aspects of the logistics. And we said we had good reports for INEC that there's an improvement in logistics. But the key thing about logistics, nobody goes to court in Nigeria challenging logistics. I've not seen a case find that election started by 10 instead of 8.30. I see cases that challenge saying my votes were cancelled. Beavers was not used. The wrong results were declared. So the challenge for electoral democracy in Nigeria is less about logistic failures and more of integrity and regulatory competence failure. So that after election, I now go into a, a round of consultations with, uh, with uh, road transport union. Uh, they say they are learning how to improve. That's not the urgent work. The urgent work is how do we ensure that next time the commission itself does not sabotage itself by switching the electronic? How do we ensure that those who didn't win election primary of their party do not become candidates? Those are not technology failures. Those are not logistic failures. Those are deliberate acts of sabotage by persons entrusted with those responsibilities. The EU talk about the case of Ababio and the case of Lawan. You didn't need road transport union. You needed simply to follow your rules. You didn't need to agree with Mike Guinea, the rec, who told you that this person wasn't a candidate. And so our report, I would like to read the last sentence in this report, the conclusion, because it kind of sums up what we are thinking about. We talked about the fact that the elections were shambolic and that democracy without elections is not democracy. The election without democracy is not democracy. And we said this invariably means that being truly a rule of law state precedes being a democratic state. If we don't first ensure that our institutions work according to the principles of rule of law, we cannot transition to democracy. Very simple. We can't close our eyes to the fact that all democracies, all elections are done according to law. And there are laws about who is qualified to run an election. If you don't follow your laws according to who is qualified to stand for election, then you're not running a democracy. Rule of law is critical here, that's the missing piece here. 
Rule of law is critical. During this period, this report reports effort to differentiate voters. We heard about those who didn't have PVC will not go to vote. Is that correct? And one of our fellows, Victor Opato, Opato is not here today, went to court and secured an order that says, once you have registered, and I next first to give you a PVC, you should be entitled to vote. I next went to court of appeal. The matter couldn't finish before the election. But the point the school, the school wrote to INEC and said, if people have complied with all statutory requirements, offer themselves to register, offer themselves to create a voting material. That's basically no reason why they shouldn't vote because they're already captured biometrically. They're already in their system. For example, how about diaspora voting? In 2022, about $26 million billion was remitted from diaspora. Diaspora played a key role in this new wave of election, either as obedience or as PAPC or as PDP. Why shouldn't they also vote? How about persons in prison who are momentarily in prison, maybe for arrest pending trial? Should they not have a right to vote? How about military officers, security officers in the duty? So we raise these issues that there is a growing disenfranchisement of Nigerians through policy. At the National Assembly, when the law was being done, the National Assembly rejected diaspora voting by saying in the Electoral Act that you must be a Nigerian resident in Nigeria to vote. So these are the issues that should continue in the, in the new wave campaign. What the school have done is to crystallize these issues, look at the facts of the election, interrogate them, and relate them to the concept of democracy and development that Nigeria is pursuing, and picking out gaps and suggesting what should be done. But the bottom line is that we conclude that 23 election was election without democracy. And what that means is that it was election con con conducted in violation of the Electoral Act substantially, election consulted with violence. We can't forget the March 18 violence where some people were stopped from voting in Lagos State. That is a major violation of the, all the conventions on democratic rights. If people were terrorized from voting, then that means you cannot say that that voting was democratic. We, we recorded that and said the fact that the Nigerian state and the INEC did not react to those systematic and structural disenfranchisement speaks to a major failure. We talked about it's unbelievable that a commission will make a regulation to say this is how we will transmit results. And after election, come back and say it is discretionary. That is never done anywhere in the world. As a, as a scholar of administrative law, administrative law 101, that's why we say election with democracy. Democratic theories have, have laid three conditions of a democracy from a no liberal side. I mean, uh, critical scholars like we them can criticize all the whole framework. But the three basic one, the right of people to decide who to vote. First, the right of people to express themselves, political freedom associate, form parties, good. Second, the right of people to vote. Three, the right that that vote should be counted properly and declared properly. And that's why I think, I think it was Stalin who says that the guy who matters not the voters, but those who count the votes. Counting the vote is actually the real guarantor of democracy. And that's why the electronic transmission and all the verifications, accreditation, was, was very important. And that's what drew up the enthusiasm of young people. We had six point something million new voters, as we are told. Basically, more of young people who had confidence in the innovations that were promised. Innovations that INEC deliberately dismantled. So this report is transparent in saying, all said and done, the 23 election, as Professor Justice Insofo said concerning uh, the 23, I think, Buhari, one of the Buhari elections. He says it was a sham. It never happened. 
when he looked at all the retinue of, of, of violations, Nsofo, JC, late Nsofo, said it was a sham. So what the school is saying that this is an election without democracy. It fails the fundamental test of substantial compliance. And going forward, we should revise all those who have noted. People should be enfranchised more. The electoral system should be transparent and accountable. The umpire should make rules that are based on fairness. For example, during the primary, build up to the primary, the, the parties ask for two weeks more extension to enable them to do good primary. The regulator says no. They, on the eve of PDP primary, on the eve, they extended two weeks and APC had how to cancel their own and plan. That's unfair regulation. You cannot give parties advantage in the process. PDP had to do a horrid primary because they're they cut out of time. And then you give people two more weeks to sort out the Mefele issues. That's a deliberate unfair regulation. And so these are the things that we didn't just look at the voting, we look at the build up, preparation, how we started failing. We call that chapter planning to fail. Because you have started planning to fail. And we chronicled all the failures in terms of lack of due process, lack of fairness that built up to the voting day crisis after the pivots didn't work. And then the report ends with a look at judiciary. And we argue that going forward, they should change the constitution so that first, three issues are important. You cannot install a governor, a president, and still have cases run against them is actually illogical. Because the essence of that inauguration is that they are now constitutionally cleared to take out of office. That's why in other countries they have a timeout, a day, whether the case is finished or not. Once you are certified, in the US example, the Congress will meet and certify the president. All cases end. So we, now, we cannot have somebody act as president or commander in chief. And you are saying that it has a, a possibility that it could be thrown out of power. So you are doing two things wrong. If you say because he's already president, let's allow him, you have destroyed electoral justice. And if you follow electoral justice, you can create a lot of uncertainties. So the best thing is he has to face his case and then you swear them in or you close down every case at a date. The second we gave suggestion in this, in this report is that we should have a process of taking legal cases straight to the Supreme Court. For example, the question of 25% of Abuja should have been taken straight to the Supreme Court to determine where we still struggle with who won which state. Those issues are points of law that should go to the Supreme Court for quick determination. How can you be, have a president whose election is being challenged on constitutional grounds and they're not determined when it could easily be determined? So we have structured a procedural innovation where trials can move straight to be determined at the court of at the Supreme Court, and that's final over issues of law, compliance with the law. Then issues around vote counting can be done administratively. So, guys, you have seen it for yourself that INEC is not even after the interests of Nigerians. They are just there for their own personal interest. Every year, it is one problem or the other. Despite the fact that we went very far to fix some of our issues, you may, I mean, despite the fact that we, despite the fact that we made, despite the fact that we made tremendous improvements in our electoral system, but INEC flawed everything by not allowing results to be uploaded from the polling units to the IREF. This alone destroyed the entire process. It might shock you to even know that the money that was used for this election, it is now considered to be a waste because it's the judiciary that it would... Because it is now the judiciary that will be declaring who won this election and no more INEC. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. Thank you.